at a time we actually um, uh, need to, to work on it. What I'd like to do, though, is pick up where we left off on Thursday. So remember we were watching the, uh, com we watched the commercial about the happy cows and the great teas, right? And um, the, the question that I have was, was you know, uh, how do we resolve this cliffhanger? And of course, I think it was Luke who called out the answer. So, so let's duplicate the, the, the two tags at the end of the commercial. Um, we have great cheese comes from happy cows and then happy cows come from California. And then the commercial ends and, you know, we're on tender hooks. It's so, it's so exciting. Like, like, isn't it the case that your mind moves, right, from these two sentences to a third? Now, without, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to um, muzzle you, Luke, if you don't mind, w without giving it away, Luke. Um, <laughs> whether you remember or, or, or not, does it make sense to say that if these two sentences are true, a third follows from that, or these two imply a third, or a third is inferred from them? And if so, how do you formulate that sentence? What do you think in Parsem? I think if it was not. Good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And by the way, one of the things that I appreciate about um, what Parzam has done is he's explained to us his thinking, how he got from point A to point uh, uh, C. You may not engage in the exact same process whereby you're um, uh, uh, proposing variables and so forth, or whereby you're thinking, oh, this is like math. So here, so let me ask you this question. What's another way that you can talk about how you got to this point? Some of you might be thinking, well, Mia, it's obvious. And, and we need to talk about that, right? But even if you think it's obvious, do you still say slow your roll? You don't say that anymore? Okay. Slow down <laughs> and, and think about what makes you believe that this is true. Chloe, what are you thinking? Okay. Very similar to what Farsan was, was uh, talking about with the, with the variables. I think you also used something along the lines of an identity statement. So um, what if we do this? What if we say, okay, great cheese, we're going to pull out. We'll just write this, great cheese. And then a dash for uh, the, the comes from because um, we're not going to try to articulate at this point uh, what logical sense we're meant to make of, of the, the phrase comes from. Both Farzam and Chloe talked about it in terms of identity. Um, and we don't, and, and it doesn't mean quite that, but that's a good uh, kind of stopgap. So great cheese dash happy cows. And then remember Farzam had alerted us to the repetition of the term happy cows in that second sentence. Happy cows come from California. And then does it make sense to say that you effectively let the happy cows term sort of transfer the relationship over? And that's, that's, I think, what you have in mind when you're talking about, you know, mathematics and this equals uh, the concept of equality, right? So the happy cows dropped out and you got great cheese comes from California. <clears throat> so here's what I want us to, to think about. You are, you want to be aware that What's at issue here is not whether or not we think it's true that great cheese comes from happy cows or whether or not we know what a happy cow is, right? Maybe 
You've never met a cow, let alone a happy cow. And oh my gosh, how are we supposed to determine whether or not a cow is happy? I don't even know how to determine if I'm happy, right? So we sort of suspend judgment about, if you will, the content of the claims, right? And instead, what we do is we try to look at the structure of the thing, which is to say, we're looking at the logical relations between the terms, right? Contrast that with the example that we talked about on Thursday, where um, I mentioned, you know, the, the, the car uh, that you go to start uh, doesn't turn over, and the question is why, and from your experience, whether it's your own lived experience or what you've heard from others, you say, oh, it's the battery as opposed to something else, right? That kind of empirical reasoning that, or experiential reasoning um, we use all day, every day. Uh, it doesn't, that reasoning doesn't give us the level of certainty that we get with reasoning like this. Jeremy, what are you thinking? So, I was reading chapter three. Yes. And the formula, but it's not necessarily sound because there's a, a certain point of assumption, right? Because yeah. um, like, for example, like there was, they would go, they were breaking down sentence about that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they're saying technically the formula, you can argue that it's correct, the structure, but like the assumption is like flawed in a way. Does that make sense? It does. Because and of like, kind of the way that they put the when you say assumption, so, so let's bring to bear some technical language so that when we're having these sorts of conversations, we can use the sort of shorthand of the technical language. The, the flaw in the assumption um, is this. At least one of the assumptive sentences or assumptions or what we call premises is false. Right. So, so let me give you an example. I'm fast forwarding, P.S. to um, uh, structures that we're going to to learn uh, starting in chapter four. But I hope that this is intuitive enough to where you say, "Oh, I get it," and now I can. Uh, um, what's what am I looking? What am, what's the word I'm looking for? You can you can you can backfill. Sorry to to here to the to the simpler stuff. So um, let's take the, so can I erase this? Or actually, no, I'll just go over here. And I'm assuming we'll get. All right, so suppose that I have the, the following piece of reasoning. Uh, Mitt Romney or Barack Obama uh, was the 44th US president. And then my second assumption or my second premise, and we'll, we'll talk more about the meanings of the technical terms in a minute, but let's just, let's pr um, leverage your, uh, your sort of intellectual intuitions here. Um, Mitt Romney was, wasn't the 44th US president. So as a, as a matter of elimination, what's left? Barack Obama. So Barack Obama, Obama was the 44th US president. All right, now, stage one of uh, uh, addressing Jeremy's really good uh, uh, comments on reasoning, first, what we have here in what's known as standard form, um, and standard form is just the, the language we use when we put an argument uh, into a specific order where we uh, uh, place one on top of the other, the evidence or the reasons to believe or the assumptions or the premises. And then below them at the end is the conclusion, right? The termination of the, the reasoning. So we've got an argument and we'll define what an argument is technically, uh, but for the moment, this is an argument. Um, in other words, we've got an inference from evidence or statements that are true or false, right? The structure of this argument is going to be evaluated 
in a, a specific way. First, we evaluate whether or not it's what's known as logically correct or that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises or that the argument is valid or not. Then we take another, uh, uh, um, or sorry, then we take the next step, which is to ask if the argument is what's known as sound. So we'll get to that in just a sec. Matthew, what are you thinking? Uh, it, the, so, so we'll get into the, we'll walk through the details, but the answer to your question is a sound argument is valid and the premises are actually true, right? Jeremy, what are you thinking? No, no, this is what we're here for. I mean, you're, you're not asking questions that aren't relevant, so go for it. Uh-huh. Maybe, maybe not. Like, maybe, we, maybe not. Cause, no, cause we have to go to a different class to talk about theories of truth. We get a few theories of truth in here, but... Because what I mean is, like, what I remember reading in chapter 2, it said something that, say, for example, in terms of like reading and things, it's saying that the proof has to be like pretty much 100%, because over long term, if it's 99%, at, at, at first it seems almost likely that's going to be true, but over the more complex, there's going to certainly be a false aspect to it. And so maybe Very likely, like, there may yeah. be a false claim in there, yeah. So I'm thinking, now I'm thinking, okay, something like that, if I were to look at that, and if I were to go, historically speaking, okay, the rock was the present. I mean, this is... Yes, problem. that would be a way so that you'd you can, evaluate the sentence. You can evaluate that, but sure. the left statement is more subjective, right? So Could be, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's very generalized to say, happy cows are going to rot on the well, it's not so much that, well, the, the generalization is, is potentially a, a, a problem, right? When you're making exhaustively generalized claims, when you're saying that every single piece of great cheese falls into the happy cows category, and that's a pretty stri stringent claim, right? Um, and whereas if you make a, a more limited claim, like some great cheese comes from happy cows, then you would be more likely to, to say that that claim is true, given what you've said about observation, right? Um, yeah, but I'm not so sure that that's what's going on here. Yeah. No, no, hold on, don't give up on that, but let's let let's just like just table it or set it aside for the moment and then we'll circle back because I, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Matthew, what do you think in Homer? What are you thinking? It's not really logically correct, isn't it? But like but like logically valid argument, uh, it makes sense that a part of the truth is false. Okay, so yeah, so let's let's push on on the, the difference between uh, what's known as a uh, uh, a sound argument, which is valid, uh, versus a valid argument that's not sound. Okay. Well, you yeah, they the, you can have uh, so we'll use another example of the same formula, but the content is different, which then um, informs the evaluation of the argument uh, as unsound. Homer, what are you thinking? Yeah, you're what I sorry to interrupt, but I, here's what I think you're after. Could we do this? Could we say that um, uh, great cheese is within the happy cows uh -huh. category, and the happy cows ca category in turn is within the things come that come from California category, and so when you diagram this. You walk away, right? So you diagram these two sentences, you walk away, and you notice that the conclusion just is automatically thereby diagrammed. Is that what you're after? Exactly. Yes. What's yep. the validity concept? Uh, it, it, yeah, it's one way that we can start to understand what it means to say that an inference is a logical consequence of the premises. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, this will. This is one way. Um, mainly because, and that, you know, remember, I'm fudging a bit. I'm not going to ask us to think about what the logical structure is of comes from, which is what's supposedly uniting great cheese, happy cows in California, right? Um, and and so since I'm not doing that, I'm just saying, oh well, I'm going to uh, assume that we're talking about, as Jeremy says all great cheeses and all happy cows and their relationship to uh, ultimately to California. Okay. Now to, to, to come back. So, so here's, here's what you want to start thinking about when you're thinking about um, an inference that is airtight, rock solid, guaranteed, an inference that um, you cannot deny even if you have known nothing about the premises, right? Sorry, I don't remember how I started the sentence. So regardless of what sort of argument you have, when you're evaluating the argument for logical consequence, you're saying whether or not I can be sure that the, the premises are true, I'm forced to accept the conclusion. And that goes back to, I think, Jeremy and Matthew's point about the structure of the form of the thing. That goes back to... Chloe and Farsam's point about uh, looking at uh, the form, right? Okay, so, so we've got our Mitt Romney, Barack Obama. Now, same form, different content. Uh, the moon is made of blue cheese or green cheese. The moon is not made of blue cheese. So, whoop, here I go again. So the moon is made of green cheese. Now, how many of you say, it's not made of green cheese, no, uh, 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 and you're annoyed? Like, you somehow feel a little bit betrayed, don't you? That, that you're forced into this claim. A claim you know is false. It's awful. Jeremy, what are you thinking? So with that statement, if you can say that the structure is correct, so that the, it, the validity of the argument is correct, but not necessarily the fact stating it. Right. So let's, let's, let's separate out, let's tease out uh, form from content. And, and first time, I know you have something to, to add real, real quick. Let me throw this on the board. So these two arguments have the following form. It's A or B. It's not A, so it's B. And it doesn't matter what A is. It doesn't matter what B is. It's one or the other. It's not the one, so it must be the other. Okay? So that's the form of the thing. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. First time, what are you thinking? Are you saying that you have a piece of reasoning that does not include this first sentence? It includes the first sentence, but it has to be inferred in a way where it doesn't guarantee the argument. You just have that A or B option. So what I hear you saying is um, that the or might be inclusive, which is to say it's one or the other, could be both. Chloe's shaking, no, no, no. Her, Chloe's shaking her head no. No? Ah, okay. So, no, the form is not context sensitive. I mean, it, do you guys still say it is what it is? Yeah. yeah? Okay. It, in other words, it is what is presented, which is to say it's at least one of these things. Then you'd have to assert that. Does that make sense? Yeah? What what else? What are we thinking? I feel like pe people could do it. No? Okay. All right. So is it fair? So 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 you know, think about I don't know if, if I'm going if no, I'm, I'm good. You don't want to go down that 
you don't want to you don't want to beat that more. Oh, but I wanted to talk about a court case and what you're allowed to consider as evidence. No? Okay. All right, okay. So so <laughs> I mean, you know, think about how hard it might be if you are uh, let's say a juror and you are told that the scope of your considerations with determining the facts of the case is limited to just what's in evidence, right? That's, That's it. So we brought up three pieces of evidence that are very, very clear that put in the evidence. That makes sense. We add, then we have to say it. We want, we have to say that to this jury. Well, if, if if we want, so 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 let me let me back out of that and say the the following. When you assert, in this case, an or statement, and we'll see this when we get to specifically chapter three and more extensively in applications in chapter four, when you assert an or statement, you're saying at least one of these is the case. And if you want to add more things, you got to say so. Okay. Okay, so what if there's, there's, two, there's, there's two things that might be the case, and then we conclude that one is the case, but then it's not actually true. Like, right. Like, because of fact, are we supposed to, like... Yeah, that's, not, that's what my, my thought was. Like, yeah. we have to accept that one of these two things are true. Well, sure. A a example. I love this one because it always it allows me to make a small child cry. Um, so, so, so suppose let's let's make part of my my monkey um, my monkey drive be uh, a a a supposed you know a piece of a candy and my keys can be the other right. So you know suppose that I that I uh, am going to to tell a kid uh, that. Um, there, there's candy available, right? So, you know, I walk up, and by the way, just make sure the kid is small enough to where if they get violent, the physical damage to you is not going to be as extensive as it would be if they were older, right? So, so you go up to the kid and you say, hey, kid, right? So let's say like, you know, three, four years old, um, sickly would be ideal for the aforementioned reason, right? So like three, four years old, and you say, hey, kid, I've got candy in my left hand or my right hand. And I say left and right, even though this is my right, right? But I do that because it's, it's, a, it's a dumb little kid, right? From their perspective, left, right? Okay, kid, candy's in my left hand or my right hand. And of course, the kid's like, <gasps> right? And I say, okay, kid, candy's not in this hand. And the kid is now going like batshit crazy with excitement, right? Because if candy's in this hand or this hand and it's not in this hand, what's left? So now I go, okay, kid, candy in this hand or this hand, it's not in this one. Ha ha! No. So, so hold, slow, slow down, slow down, right? Hey, kid, candy's in my left hand or my right hand, right? And the kid says, sure. The kid believes me. I mean, the kid wants the freaking candy, right? Okay, candy, this hand or this hand, it's not in this hand. Now, is, is, the, is the kid a dummy? Notice I didn't ask you to, to, to talk about do this with a little vegetable baby, right? Because they're no fun at all. I mean, they cry and it's not even because you made them cry. You get the three and the four year old, right? And they grasp, oh, okay, you're saying, you you know, I'm an adult. They believe me. <laughs> Candy's in my left hand or my right hand. It's not in my left. So, kid? And the kid's saying it's got to be in the? Okay. So, so what does the kid do that you and I do? Makes the inference based on what? Yeah, the premises. I assume, I accept for the sake of moving forward that the candy's in this hand or this hand. They're not gonna start asking me about my pockets when I, when I open up my right hand and it's empty. What's the kid gonna do, guys? Do, what? Okay, candy's in this hand or this hand, it's not in this hand, so it's ha ha. They're gonna cry, which is, a, which is a benefit. And then what are they gonna do? Be upset and what are they gonna call me? A liar. Thanks, Rashid. They're going to call me a liar. 
the kid understands the concept of logical consequence, a.k.a. validity, right? So, so going back first, I'm to your great question, Chloe, to your, your follow-up. Look, here are the parameters. Okay, so here we go. Uh, actually true? Yes? yes? Actually true? Yes. Actually true. Okay. Actually true or false? Uh, false? Actually true or false? False. I <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually true or false? Okay. So, does the actual truth or falsity make a difference to logical consequence, which is just the general evaluation term for saying that on the assumption that my first two sentences in this case are true, the third sentence has to be true, right? Such that if, like with the kid, I lie, what sentence did I lie about? Yeah, it's false that the candy's in one hand or the other. It's false that the moon is made of blue or green cheese. It's true that the candy's not in my left. It's true that the moon, but the actual truth or falsity is entirely irrelevant to the question of the conclusions following from the premises. So what we do is, is we say we say this if if true right then the conclusion is true same with the content or sorry same with the moon argument same with the candy argument so when you then so so here's then how we make the next step and ps we won't spend uh, much time at all in our work together on determining soundness and we'll talk about why but when it comes to soundness right Barack Obama argument is sound which is to say it is valid and the premises are true actually the green cheese argument is valid but unsound right now if you find feel like you're playing mental twister it's like puberty. It sucks, but it's normal and natural. So just, just, just live with it. It'll get better. Matthew, what are you thinking? Um. Yeah. So, so, so if we, so, so now, maybe this will be helpful. If we go into Tarski's world, right? Um, we know that. We can't talk about green cheese in Tarski's world because we cannot build a world where the moon is green cheese or blue cheese. We cannot build a world where we have little icons of Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. We can't build a world where we have a crying little kid who's calling me a liar. Right? In Tarski's world, we've got three possible shapes, three possible sizes, and what is it, six possible names, right? Or seven, I can't remember, I can't count. Right, so what we do is use Tarski's world, in, in this case, to help us sort of isolate what it means to say that an argument is valid or invalid. And because we're dealing with Tarski's world, when we build a world where uh, we've got a, a certain set of objects arranged in a certain way, and then we have an argument that reflects that arrangement, it'll also be sound, right? So we'll, we'll push on that in a little bit more, in a little bit, in, in a little bit. Okay, so, so here's what I, here, here, two things before we um, move on. When you walk away today, the big concepts that you want to start to live with and feel comfortable with uh, will be uh, logical consequence, a.k.a. validity, right, uh, and a basic test of validity. So that's more of a skill than a concept, okay? And then we'll get used to it over time, and eventually what we'll see is, that, is this. So going back to this argument here, 
in chapter six, we will learn a procedure to demonstrate how the premises yield the conclusion. So we'll take time making a distinction between logically correct arguments, valid arguments, arguments whose conclusions are the logical consequences of the premises. We'll, we'll be, be able to distinguish. Then we have a set of tools or rules that will um, that we will employ to demonstrate how we get to that conclusion. So here's a verbal, here's a verbal approach, okay? Um, it's, it's one of, of two approaches. Um, since I don't know which one of these ors is true, right? Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, because I remember going back, Jeremy, to your point about the actual truth or falsity of the claim. I suspend judgment. I don't know. I'm just going to assume the thing is true. So, you know, as Parzan points out, an or can be true when at least one is true. Maybe both are true. So since I don't know which is true, I first assume that Mitt Romney is uh, the 44th president. But wait a minute, that contradicts my second premise. So that can't be true, which means it's Barack Obama. Now I'm going to assume that it's Barack Obama, and if I'm assuming it's Barack Obama, then I say it's Barack Obama. So in either case, I get Barack Obama. That's a verbal way, one verbal way, to do what we're going to do in Chapter 6. Okay, so first, uh, definition. An inference, or sorry, let me back out of that. Uh, definitions. One is, or sorry, let me pause for just a second, because I realized, what, Carl, did you have a comment or a question? Oh, it was Homer. I'm sorry. Homer, Carl, sure. Why not? Right. So, but yeah. The example that you said about the candy, the premises also were false because there was, there was no candy in your hand. Right. So it was, it was it's still a valid argument. It's a silly valid argument, yeah. it's not sound. Correct. Beautiful. Good for you. Right now, this is some, you know, some concept juggling that you're doing. But again, you, you'll, you'll get there. But that's exactly right. Yes. Could you say anytime someone lies, it is unsound? Uh, yes. But then you have to establish that the that the claim is is false. So that might take a bit of doing. Yeah, yeah. Matthew, what are you thinking? Correct. Right. So valid and sound, or we could just say sound because part of the definition of soundness includes validity. Second, the moon argument, the the candy argument, valid but unsound. Right. What else, Jeremy? What are you thinking? So, in terms of validity, it's um, not correct to say it's because it doesn't go about the structure in a way. It's a, yes, it is the structure and then for exclusively. Sound, and then for sound, it's both the structure and the facts and the content. And the content. Yeah. So it think it. Be valid, but not necessarily sound. Right. Right. So, so, so here's a here's another really awful uh, example. Um, you, you, we all know what a meat grinder is, right? Or, or heck, a wood chipper. Okay. So, so how many people have seen the the Cohen Brothers movie Fargo? And if you haven't, put it on your list. Okay. Remember the wood chipper scene? Yeah. Doesn't matter what you put into the wood chipper, the wood chipper is gonna spew out a bunch of chips, in a manner of speaking, right? So when you put a body into the wood chipper. Right? What came out? Yeah. Now, my other example is equally um, uh, gross, and it's just plain mean, uh, but but uh, it's one you, I expect you'll remember. So, so you, you got a meat grinder, right? Let's talk about the old-fashioned meat grinder. And, you know, typically what you do is you take slabs of meat, you put it in there, and you grind, and then, and then what comes out is just the shape of whatever the grinder is. Maybe you put attachments on it, right? And so you have, like, little, you know, meat stars 
right? Well, it doesn't matter what kind of meat you put in there. You can put in, you know, kittens, right? Or you could put in, you know, a side of beef, right? So, so think about the form or structure of the argument as like a meat grinder or a wood chipper. If the, the, if the form of the argument is valid, then it doesn't matter what content you put in, Mitt Romney, green cheese, candy, right? The, the, the form of the thing will guarantee the outcome. What, how are we doing? Does that make, make some sense? Farzan, what are you thinking? Yes. Yeah, so demand is a nice way to think about it too. Sure. Um, okay, so, so let's do this so that we can make sure that we've got some of our technical language down. Um, let me throw out some definitions and then let's go to um, Tursky's world so that we can see what is involved at this stage of our work together in evaluating an argument as logically correct or not, right? Because once you um, wrap your head around the concept of logical correctness, AKA the argument is valid, then you need to wrap your head around what it means when an argument fails, that is when it is invalid, okay? All right, so really quickly, um, let's do this. I'm going to use basically just some, some keywords um, so that I can avoid being verbose. I have a tendency toward verbosity. So um, we know that an argument is a set of statements, one of which is supported by the other or others. And P.S., when the argument is valid, it's not just that the premises support the conclusion, the premises establish the conclusion, right? So going back, Jeremy, to your great question about sort of the, 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 the cheese example, if we have um, either agreed uh, that it's the case that great cheese comes from happy cows. You know, we've done some studies and we find out that that's, that that's true, right? And we also know that uh, happy cows, somehow we've established that happy cows come from California, right? We've got the best weather, so they're happier here than they are in, I don't know, Minnesota or whatever, right? Then the, the, those two premises provide a demonstration, effectively, of the conclusion, right? Okay, so we've got a set of statements, one of which is supported or, in the case of a valid argument, established by the other or others. Um, the premise or premises, premise is the supporting statement in an argument. Oops. Um, you can also talk about the premises as uh, the evidence, the proof, the reasons to believe, right? And remember, just because someone mounts an argument doesn't mean that you um, buy the conclusion, right? So, so here's something really nice, I think, about the work that we're going to do together. We're going to be able to separate out our various beliefs from just the structure of the thing, right? The structure of the argument. Can I evaluate this argument in terms of its formal features, right? And then I can always do more work to talk about the, the content, right? So what we do is we say, hey, okay, I'm going to accept the, the premises, even if I don't believe them because I want to see where the argument goes. Okay? And we'll talk about some, some quote-unquote real-life examples. Um, the conclusion is the inference uh, from the premises. 
and I'm abbreviating premises as PRR, or the conclusion is the statement that is established by or inferred from uh, the premises, or we could say the conclusion is implied by the premises. So implication is in the direction of premises to conclusion. Inference is the direction of from the premises, right? From, from the standpoint, if you will, of the conclusion itself. Now, how do we evaluate an, an argument? Um, we say that, uh, so let's talk about validity. So valid argument is uh, an argument whose conclusion can't be false if, and I'm underlining if, the premises are true. So what we don't make our business, so, so what we don't make our business uh, for the most part in our work together is determining the truth or falsity of the premises. Now, one way we can talk about truth is uh, very sort of commonsensical. It's what you and I do a lot. It's what we do in Tarski's world. We compare the sentence with the world, right? And we see if the sentence corresponds to the world. And when the sentence corresponds to the world, it's true. And when the sentence doesn't correspond to the world, it's false. That's one way we can talk about, about truth, right? But you know, not every sentence that's asserted is, you know, empirically verifiable, right? Um, okay, so a valid argument is uh, uh, an argument that involves uh, the premises being sort of a sufficient, uh, sorry, rephrase, that involves the premises being sufficient for the conclusion or the premises guarantee the conclusion. The conclusion must be when the premises are true. For example, what are you thinking? Oh, yeah. By the way, um, Farzam's uh, asking me to read out what I wrote is a nice reminder. Obviously, my writing isn't always legible. Um, and then also sometimes maybe the, the lights might might uh, make the, might shine. Might? What's the, how do I want to talk about the sentence? There might be a glare. <laughs> okay, so, so argument, a set of statements, one of which is supported by the other or others. Oh, the last one, a valid argument, and I abbreviated argument with arg. An argument, a valid argument is one whose conclusion can't be false if the premises are true. And then, as um, Homer already pointed out, a sound argument is valid and the premise or premises are true. Okay. So um, for right now, we've got this big picture view of the concept of logical correctness, also AKA logical consequence, AKA validity, right? And what we do typically is we have this big picture, this sort of panoramic view, if you will, of, of that concept. Um, and then as we work through uh, chapters, we drill down into how that concept plays out um, in connection with other uh, theories of truth, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so, so far, so good. I okay. want to make sure that uh, we have time to go over any questions, problems, confusions you might have about procuring um, the uh, software. But first, let's just keep, um, let's piggyback off what we just did. All right, so I'm opening up the Tursky's World program. And as a reminder, can everybody see this okay? Booty. I'm going to make sure that the text size is large enough. Okay. Um, as a reminder, right, we've got two panes within the program, and each pane, when you either open up a, a pre given file or you save uh, a pane, is going to have a, a different uh, file extension. 
So for world files, it's .wld. For sentence files, it's .sen. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, focus on, at the top, the object types and sizes, and then the names. Then I'm going to ask you to drop your eyeballs down to these buttons, and you'll, you'll notice that uh, you can create your own sentences by clicking on buttons. You can also type directly into a sentence pane. Um, but, but let me offer the, the following um, um, piggyback on what we were just talking about in the context of what we have started um, talking about in terms of our atomic or simple sentences, right? So if I, every time I click on the new button, as a reminder, you'll see a small cube uh, appear in the lower left corner of the, the, the who's he, what's at the board. Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, say that the dough deck is named B, and I'll make the cube named A, and I'm going to just put them here closer to the center, and let's make them big so that we can see. Okay. Um, so if I write the following sentence, I'm going, uh, blah, where'd it go? You think I know? Left of. If I'm going to, uh, 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 talk about validity with these two objects, um, involved in, in atomic sentences, I can do something like this. Um, A is, uh, to the left of B. And, uh, sorry, let me make one more object, and let's name this object C, and I'll make him big. Okay, so A is to the left of B, uh, and let's also say uh, that A is to the left of uh, C, right? Remember, too, that we can verify our sentences, right? So, so clicking verify is a way of uh, asking if a sentence corresponds to a given world. And we find out that each of these sentences is true. Um, you can tell all on your own that the sentences are, sentences are true, but it's nice to, to, to verify, right? There are times when things will get a little bit less easy to, to see. And now the, the question is whether or not the inference I am about to uh, type is a logically correct uh, inference or if the third sentence is a logical consequence of the first two. Farzam, what are you thinking? Right, so hold on to that. Don't, um, don't forget that. All right, so now I'm going to say... Uh, left of B, C. Okay, I'm going to verify that sentence. Now, question for you. Does the fact that all three of these sentences are true mean that the third sentence is a logical consequence of the first two? And a number of people are shaking their heads no. So, Let's talk about why that is. Luke, what are you thinking? Um, the third, no, the, uh, the second premise, that can be true without, that can be true without the first and the last premise. So like, but the, so, so if I understand you correctly, my response is this. The, the question is taken together do these two sentences, sentence one and sentence two, force us to accept sentence three? And Derege and, uh, and um, uh, Michael, Homer, Farzad, a few people are saying, no, it doesn't. So, so how can you talk about that? Okay. So just because we have an actually true set of sentences uh, does not mean that we can't falsify the third 
while maintaining the truth of the first two, right? So tell me, so, so tell me what to do to the world so as to preserve the truth of the first two sentences but falsify the third. Right? Okay. So here's what we want to think about. And I'm going to give you another relational example um, that, will, that will either reinforce the, uh, what we've just done here or clarify. Um, the question before us when we're talking about logical consequence is whether or not the givens right, force us or demand, as far as M says, or guarantee the third. So whenever you can, so here's our general test of validity. It's called the counterexample method. Whenever you can preserve the truth of your premise or premises but falsify the conclusion, right, you thereby show the argument is invalid. Now, I know I'm, I'm speaking it, and you might be writing some notes. Well, so, so leave some space. We'll come back to that. How, but how are we doing with the, with the basic idea? So what we want to do to, to test an argument for validity in this presently very general way, right? We don't have uh, very, we don't really have any technical tools right now. We will have technical tools. But so our very general tool is to, in this case, attempt to build a world in which the premises are true while the conclusion is false. And it's not even, in this case, yes, it's world building. But in other cases, it's not even about world building. It's about providing a counterexample. All right, and we'll, we'll talk more, more about that in just a moment. But does this basic idea make, make sense? Okay. So now, so, so sorry, so far as Zam had said earlier, um, forgive me, C correct me if I don't have the, the language that you use, but you said something like, before I wrote sentence three, yeah. right, okay, so what, what, so, so, Here's so one inference. So let's come back here, right? One inference is is that uh, B is left of C. What's another inference that follows? But not is not a guarantee, as we just saw. What else could you say? Yeah, you could. Well, yeah, okay, you could say C is left of B, which is which is effectively the same. Or I'm sorry, I thought you meant I thought you were going to say B C is right of of B if we leave things the same. In relation to each other. Yes. Yeah. Good, good. Okay. So hold on to that. We're going to come back to the, the counterexample method in, in just a moment. Um, now, oh, so let's do this. So now let me change the thing. Okay. So I changed the second premise. I didn't change the world. First premise stayed the same. So A is left of B, that's true. B is left of C, that's true. And at present, or sorry, A is left of C is what should be the third one. Sorry. I also changed, ha, I changed the third premise, uh, the third sentence. Okay. <laughs> and, and A is left of C is also true. Question for you, given these two premises, can you falsify the third sentence? And I want to, not Alan, we're making, we're, we, right now we're looking at each other. Daniel, Alan, of course. Daniel shook his head, no. Uh, Daniel said with the head shake, no, given these two premises, you cannot falsify the conclusion. Yes, you can try, and this is why going back far as I'm to what you said about what would what you would do if you didn't have the world is helpful. 
having the world is really useful because you can you can try to build a world in which the first two premises are true and the the third sentence is false, but you won't be able to do it. So here's what we mean by validity. And let's just think about, uh, for right now, Tarski's world. An argument is valid when there's no possible world. Doesn't matter how many worlds you make, there's no possible world that you could create in which, oops, what did I do? I hit the, boy, uh, we had this dramatic ending and then I, I screwed it up. Hold on. As they say, go back to one. Wait. Oh, I see what I did. Oh, poops. Let's just do it this way. Don't worry. I'll edit it out of our video and it'll be seamless. Really? Well, screw it. Here, I'm just going to... I'm doing do it manually exactly. Okay. La 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 la. Okay, so there is no possible world. So think of I don't know, however many configurations of worlds there could be. There is no world in which you will never have a world in which. Now, take that thinking out of Tarski's world. Now, let's think about our world. <laughs> which is to say every possible sentence, right? When an argument is valid, there will not be a possible world in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false because the structure of the argument demands the conclusion, right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, Fernie, what are you thinking? In the world, technically matter what it Great question. No, so 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 the um, the only restrictions we have on relational predicates involve uh, between, and maybe it's not even a so 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 the restriction on between is is a conventional one, right? So between we so what if we did between? Um, let me. By the way, can everybody see this? Um, icon that my mouse is hovering over, you can, you can change your view. I try not to look when I'm changing the view because I get dizzy. But anyway, so Fernie, we would say, you and I would say that B is between A and C, but Tarski's world won't. There's that restriction, right? Um, but there's no restriction, and there's a restriction on adjoins, but I don't think that's a conventional restriction. I think in the, it's part of the definition of the, of the predicate. But in any case, uh, left of, right of, front of, back of, you can be same row, same column, same diagonal, or different. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so do are we okay with the with with validity here in terms of this example? Now we're going to go back to the counterexample method. Um, Homer, what are you thinking? Right, that's why, so, so Tarski's world is restricted to three possible shapes, three possible sizes. And Homer's exactly right. If we want to talk about spheres or the moon or happy cows, we have to leave Tarski's world. Well, depending on the structure. All right, so, so think about it this way. Whether you're in Tarski's world or out of Tarski's world, there's not going to be a world given the meaning of the predicate left of right? There's not going to be a world in which if A is to the left of B and B is to the left of C, that A is not to the left of C. We just won't get that. So let's think about, so, so what I, part of what I think Homer's pushing on is this. Um, when we're talking about um, logical correctness, as long as we understand the meanings of the, the terms, right? we are going to be in, in good shape as far as drawing inferences. Um, but, so, so think about it this way. Suppose that I say something like this. Um, I don't know. Peter is friends with Matthew, and Matthew is friends with Crystal, so Peter's friends with Crystal, right? It has the same feeling of A is identical to B, right? It has that same feeling of, of the transference. But you guys would say, well, no, just because... Uh, P 
Peter and Matthew are friends and Matthew and Crystal are friends, it doesn't follow, therefore, that Peter and Crystal are friends, right? So one of the things that we do is we ask, okay, is it going to be the case that the, the meaning of, in this case, the relational predicate friends with or friends of transfers? And you say, well, no, it doesn't, right? But a left of right of does. How are we doing? Does that make some sense? All right, so let's go ahead and, and, and leave Tarski's world for just a second um, and then and, and push on this counterexample method uh, a little bit more. So, so here's how, here's how the, 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 we would evaluate the Peter's friends with Matthew, Matthew's friends with Crystal, so Peter's friends with Crystal argument. We would say, look, you and I understand that the, the predicate friends with or friends of does not transfer relationships any more than loves does, right? You know, if I say, I love Victor and Victor loves JJ, therefore I love JJ, I mean, it's the same thing. We say, well, not, not necessarily, because we understand that that, that, that term is not a, um, uh, a transitive term, right? Uh, but left of right of does establish the, the transference. What more, uh, sorry, rephrase, uh, the identity symbol transfers, right? Uh, so if I say A is identical to B and B is identical to C, it must be the case that A is identical to C. So, so, that, so, so that's one approach. Another approach would be to say, okay, I'm going to stipulate because maybe I'm going to enter into a game world like Fortnite or something like that. I heard that that game has made billions of dollars in profit. Although I think some people that might have contributed to the game got screwed out of money. But in any event, uh, so, so in a game, right, you could stipulate that the, the, the relational predicate friends of or loves or likes does transfer. But, but notice in that world, you've stipulated the meaning and now it's a rule that you're following. Does that make some sense? All right, so let's um, just quickly finish up with the, the following. So remember Fartem talked about the fact that um, you could draw more than one inference from the, uh, that original Tarski's world argument. Well, suppose that I do this. Suppose that I say um, Fartem is older than uh, Jennifer. Tarzan is older than Fernie. So, uh, sorry. So, Jennifer is older than Fernie. Now, you probably say not necessarily to this conclusion, right? But so now let's let's slow our thinking down. Let's demonstrate that these premises can be true while this conclusion is false, even though you could come up with a scenario in which this conclusion is true. The goal when you're testing an argument for logical consequence is not to find a way to make the conclusion true. It's to see if the conclusion resists being false, right? So I might do something like this. Let's make, you know, uh, Farzam 18, and let's make uh, Jennifer 17, and let's make, uh, oh, sorry, Farzam, and let's make Fernie um, 17 and a half. I'm just guessing, right? So now, is it the case with Jennifer being 17 and Fernie being 17 and a half, is this conclusion True, no, the conclusion is false. Meanwhile, we've maintained the truth of the premises. So this is what's known as creating a counterexample, right? Where you, uh, where what you do is you falsify the conclusion. Um, more specifically, a counterexample typically involves um, maintaining the form of an argument, but just substituting different content, right? So um, uh, suppose that you do something like uh, like this. Suppose that you say, you know, all 
uh, oranges are citrus fruits. Um, all oranges uh, are uh, things containing vitamin C. So all citrus fruits are things containing vitamin C, right? Premises are true, the conclusion is true, but the way to test the thing for validity, and it, and it works when the argument is invalid, right? <laughs> it won't work if the argument is valid, but that may just mean that you, oh, sorry, rephrase, but what if you have an actually invalid argument, but you just haven't hit upon the right combination of uh, sentences for your counterexample, right? That's why we need more technically sophisticated tools. But in any event, can you maintain the same form but put different content in that shows the argument is invalid? Well, how about something like this? Um, all dogs are animals. All dogs are mammals. Uh, so all animals are mammals. And that's not the case, right? Now you might say, well, I'm not a biologist, me. I don't know if that's true or false. But you could you can come up with something else, right? I mean, you know, you could use musical instruments as your as your counterexample. But the idea is to come up with actually true premises and an actually false conclusion that shows that the argument is invalid.